Well, good morning. Happy uh, Monday. It's uh, Monday, October 20th, 2024. Beautiful day. Um, uh, f- a few things. Uh, first of all, um, hope you had a great weekend. It was cold this weekend. I think yesterday morning when I got up, it was 46 degrees. I think it's about 50, yeah, 52 right now. Um, pretty cold outside this morning. So it makes for beautiful days. It was a beautiful day yesterday. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, <laughs> so um, Thursday night, I um, as I was going to bed, my teeth were hurting, uh, my lower jaw. And I thought that was strange. So I took some aspirin and I just really, it was, I couldn't get to bed until about 2.30. So um, um, it's a long story, but uh, on on Friday, I was trying to get a dentist (laughs) to look at me and I couldn't find one. It was just, um, it was the craziest, craziest thing. Um, You would think that there's plenty of doctors and dentists out there and all that sort of thing, but apparently there's not. Apparently there's a a shortage of dentists. Um, But I did get an appointment for today. Um, So uh, this morning I'm going to go into a dentist I've never been in before um, and see if I can have them do some x-rays and see if I've got some issues with my teeth. I, um, uh, I I took Tylenol all... Friday, all Saturday, all Sunday. Well, no, I didn't do it on Sunday. On Sunday, I kind of felt like it wasn't hurting. So I said, well, I'm just going to see what happens if I don't take Tylenol. And then I made it to bed, woke up this morning and it was hurting. So <laughs> um, so I took some Tylenol and um, we'll, we'll see what happens when we go. I mean, it's uh, it, it seems like it's worse in the, mor- in, the, in the evening before I go to bed, but not in the morning. But this morning, it's opposite. It was... But well, I didn't have Tylenol this morning, so who knows? <laughs> who knows what's going on? Anyway, you go, you get older, and all of a sudden your whole body falls apart. When I was, I think, about eight years old, um, I had eight cavities because I ate a lot of sugar. There was no prohibition when I was a kid to eating sugar, so I downed sugar. I was addicted to sugar. Sugar is as addictive as cocaine. And heroin, my understanding is. And I, I, I was addicted. I probably still am addicted to sugar. Um, and uh, so I had a root canal done when I was a little kid on my tooth. And um, that root canal canal has caused me, that, that has caused me problems <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> and uh, so at some point, I'll probably have to figure something out. But anyway, and I think that time is coming up rather quickly. Um, we have, uh, one birthday today. No, we have two birthdays today. Only one's listed in here. Elizabeth Lonsway, happy birthday, Elizabeth, but also my mother-in-law, happy birthday to you. Um, it's a beautiful day and, uh, I praise God for both of you and may you have a beautiful day. Um, and let's see any other housekeeping items over the weekend, this coming Saturday is the trunk or treat, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then on Saturday night is the um, hmm, Saturday night is a lock-in, and then Sunday is worship. And then Sunday afternoon, I'm doing a wedding up in Phoenix, so I'm really excited about that. And this Thursday, um, I'm driving up to Phoenix to be uh, to go to the wedding rehearsal. Um, all right, let's see what else is there. I think that's about it. Um, let us go ahead and get into our study today. So, uh, we are in second Kings chapter 20. We're learning about the life of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a good king. And we know that Hezekiah is a good king because, uh, he seeks God's guidance and he tries to follow God's will and he prays to God. And these may seem like insignificant things, but they are not insignificant things. Um, I believe that a person, a king, who spends his day in prayer to God in the good times will automatically go to God in the bad times. If you are a king that doesn't go to prayer 
to God in the good times. When the bad kinds, when the bad times come, your immediate reaction is going to be, how can I solve this myself? But if you have a deep prayer life with God, then the reaction that you have when the bad times come are simply to go to your Father in heaven and say, God, <laughs> I need your help on this one. <laughs> and you already know I need your help on this one, right? Um, so um, there is something, um, um, there is just something about a leader who spends a good chunk of their time in prayer that I think makes them a better leader. And Hezekiah appears to me to be that type of person. He doesn't seem to be afraid or shy of following God, praying to God, and having God direct him in all the things that he does. So this is Hezekiah, but unfortunately, all kings must come to an end. And um, so let's just start reading in uh, chapter 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. So you've all heard of Isaiah. That's the largest uh, book in the Old Testament, First and Second Isaiah. Um, uh, the... the um, uh, Isaiah chapter 38, I believe, covers this whole story also. Um, and uh, I'm hearing an airplane, which I don't normally hear. <laughs> um, so you, so apparently this is covered in Isaiah chapter 38. Um, the, the, um, the story is that Hezekiah is becoming ill to the point of death. And Isaiah, we all know, uh, he gets a message from the Lord that says you're going to die. So he goes to tell Hezekiah he's going to die. And um, this, this is not good news, especially if you're a king and you want to be a good king and you don't want the kingdom to fall apart. Now, eventually, all kingdoms, right, have to get new kings or new queens or whatever. But the longer you can reign, the more stability I think about Queen Elizabeth, who reigned just recently, passed away last year, two years ago, and how amazing it was that she could reign for such a long time. There's just stability in that. Like, who's in charge? And the longer a person can stay in charge, I think the better. Obviously, if they're not doing a good job, they need to either step down and say, we need somebody better in charge or find out what their weaknesses are and, and, you know, fill those weaknesses with people that can, you know, fill those weaknesses. But th there, is, there is something about, you find this in companies um, all the time. Whenever there's a turnover in the leadership in a company, there's, there's a period of time where um, there, there's a little bit of an upheaval. You know, what's interesting is that the president of the United States serves for four years, and then at the end of four years, that president may get another four years. But the maximum amount of time a president can serve is about eight years. But the thing is, is that um, the first two years, I think you're getting your sea legs. And then the last two years is campaigning. So really, when you are president of the United States, you don't really have a lot of time to serve actually just govern and do the things you're supposed to do, um, which is why, at least in the United States, you have all these um, people who work in jobs in government that kind of carry the continuity from one administration to the other. They say, here's the history, here's the playbook we've been operating under, <laughs> and um, if you're going to make some changes, you better do them now because just to implement those changes are going to take a year or two, uh, and then you're back to campaign. And uh, you might implement a whole bunch of changes that never come to fruition because, uh, you know, it just doesn't bubble up yet. I, that's why I think I, I'm not in charge of, you know, American politics. But if I were, if I could make one change of American politics, I think it would be to have the president go for six years with another term of 
maybe four years tacked on or something like that uh, if they are doing a good job, something like that, uh, just because it's so hard. It is so hard when you change leadership. Um, all right, so um, Hezekiah is a good leader, and but unfortunately, he's about to die. <laughs> That's all I can say. So let's go to uh, verse 2. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. So he just um, got some bad news. You're going to die. And he, his initial response, his immediate response, is simply to turn his face to the wall and pray to God and say, God, you know, I just remember me and to weep. And I don't think he's weeping that he's dying. Because when Hezekiah dies, he's going to be with God, right? I mean, leaders should not weep when they die because they're going to be in a great place uh, after death. But a good, great leaders weep because they worry about what's going to happen to their kingdom when they leave. That's, and that's, to me, the spin I will put on Hezekiah, that he's not necessarily weeping that he's dying. He's weeping because he knows that when he dies, the kingdom may fall apart. And that is always, uh, always a concern of any leader in any organization. Verse 4, before Isaiah had left the middle court, court, the word of the Lord came to him, go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord your the God of your father, David, says, I have heard your prayer, and I've seen your tears, and I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hands of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. So, <laughs> maybe God realizes that uh, Hezekiah should also uh, remain as king. And so, it gives him 15 years. And, you know, 15 years is a lifetime. I know it may not sound like much, but 15 years, when you have, um, you know, you have a baby and, uh, you know, they get into high school, they're sophomore in high school by 15, and then by 18, you know, they leave. And it may, you know, 15, 15 years is, um, 15 years is, an, uh, is a generation. I mean, 15 years is, at my age, you know, I think 15 years is going to go by very, very quickly. And it probably will. But somehow, it would be good to, to count every day as a blessing and to live each day to the fullest, that the 15 years is as full as possible. Um, I'm in my early 60s, and I think about, uh, you know, what I'm going to do in the next 15, 20, uh, should God grant me, you know, 25 years of life. Um, and I know many people that retire, and then um, they, they can't stay retired. <laughs> my dad was one of them. He retired at 62, and then for about a year, he traveled, and then he said, I'm done with this, and he went back and started another business. Um, there, there's just something about, um, you know, that I, I th and I think he did that because I just don't think he could sit around and do nothing. Um and I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I, I think if you do do absolutely nothing, then I think 15 years goes by pretty quick. But I think if you fill your life with joy, happiness, family, love, you know, do things from day to day, there, there's a, uh, there's a, a Eastern religions <laughs> are very, very keen to make sure that every day counts. Um, and because, because we go into autopilot in every day, we just kind of do the same thing day after day. In the Eastern religions, one of the highest things that you can do is to actually stop and pause and think, what am I going to do today that's different from what I've done before? And, um, and I only know this because I, I heard a guy I don't know if he was Hindu or whatever, but he I, I saw a TED Talk about it, and I was just so impressed by it. 
because it is true. We live on autopilot. I mean, how many times have you gotten in your car to drive to work and you get there and you don't even remember the drive because <laughs> you're just on autopilot? Whereas you could spend that time in prayer to God. You could, um, you could, you know, talk on the phone to somebody. I mean, there's a, a million other things you could do to make that day unique. Um, anyway, I, I only bring this up because 15 years is a long time. And God is granting him, Hezekiah, an additional 15 years. And that is a huge gift. Um, the other thing I think about is, um, oh, when I graduated from college in uh, 2000, uh, 1986, and then I became a pastor, or I went to seminary in 2003, that was about... 16 years, is that right? 17 years, 17 years. And so I think my whole engineering career was only 17 years. But man, when I was doing it, I mean, it seemed like when I had practiced engineering for 17 years, like it was a lifetime, an absolute lifetime. And um, so there's a lot that can be done in, in 15 years, 17 years. All right, verse 7. Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? And Isaiah answered, This is the Lord's sign to you, that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or shall it go back ten steps? It's a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go backwards ten steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back the ten steps it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Wow. So, um, the stairway of Ahaz <laughs> obviously must be like a sundial, okay? Um, I, I, I have no idea where the stairway of Ahaz is, but I do know that before clocks— and timepieces and Big Ben and all that sort of thing. The only way that you could tell the time was by looking at the shadow of the sun on various objects. And we don't do this. We are not acclimated to this at all because we have a clock that we wear on our wrist or on our phone. And so we always know what time it is. But before all those things were invented, the way that you told the time was by looking at the shadows. And you had these fixed objects in your house, uh, in your workplace, and all these things. And you could, and you basically kind of looked down and said, that's where the shadow is. I know what time it is. And then eventually that became a sundial. They actually kind of refined it, and they put these things called sundials up. And you could actually, um, you know, know exactly, you know, pretty much to the nearest, I'd say nearest five to ten minutes, a really good sundial. Um, you, you can tell what time it is fairly accurately. Well, probably as accurate as we need in the world today is a sundial. <laughs> and um, so uh, the, the idea of um, making the time go backwards, he said, you know, time can go forwards. He could speed up to, well, they would both be miraculous. But apparently um, God made the time go backwards or made the sun, the shadow go backwards. And, um, you know, how this works and obviously, you know, there's a lot of questions behind how this possibly could, could happen, but it was enough to tell Isaiah that God would heal him and give him another 15 years of life. And so we praise God for that. Now, the other thing you do is if you know you have 15 years of life, what do you do? Um... I mean, the second part of this, the first part is he gets 15 years. All right, that's good. But the second part of this is that he knows he gets 15 years. I mean, it's one thing to know that God's healed you from this disease, but it's another thing to know that God will give you another 15 years of life. Uh, so a, a lot of plans are not undertaken, I think, when you're older in life because you're not sure how much time you have left. And um, 
And so to know that you have 15 years is actually a huge blessing. It's probably more of a blessing than just knowing that he's going to you're going to survive this this illness whatever it is. Because that means you can actually say, okay, I've got 15 years. What am I going to do in 15 years? And um cuz you know, my mom died at, at 52, my dad just died at 88, you know. So what is that means I'm in I'm in borrowed time right now. And um but if I knew that I had 15 years, what would I do? Um one of my favorite stories uh, was a, a lady that wrote into Dear Abby, and she was 80 years old. And she said, Dear Abby, I'm 80 years old, and I've want, always wanted to go to law school. <clears throat> and that means that when I graduate from law school, I'm going to be 80, what, 82 or 83? I don't know. I can't remember. Eight, let's say 83 years old when I graduate from law school. And that means I'll be 83 years old when I graduate from law school. I mean, like, nobody's going to hire an 83-year-old, but it's, it's a dream of mine, and I want to do it. Um, do you think I'm crazy? And I've, I'll never forget dear Abby's response. She said, well, how old will you be in, 80, in three years if you don't go to law school? I mean, don't let time or the idea that you, you know, of time not... You know, don't let the idea that you might not be here in three years distract you from God's work today, right? I mean, that's the that's the bottom line. If if God grants me another day on this earth, I'm going to serve Him, right? I'm I'm and if if I feel like God's got a five year task ahead of me, I'm going to start it because I don't know. I mean, Jesus, even if even if my health comes back perfectly, you are not guaranteed tomorrow. <laughs> Jesus could come tomorrow, right? There, there is no guarantee. So take every day as a gift and a blessing from God and make plans and think about the future and all these things, no matter how old you are. I don't care if you're 90. Um, Luther was once asked, if, you th if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do? And he said, well, I'll plant a tree. Because, you know, the, the world is about hope and the hope in the future. And, you know, I'm not going to sit and cower and think, oh, my goodness, it's all falling apart. I'm just going to continue on with a life with the hope for the future. That's the way we should live our life. That's what I think. I've been thinking about this stuff a lot. All right, so um, let's go to verse 12. At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> um, uh, so this is Babylon, the king of Babylon, and, and um, he sends envoys with a letter and a gift, you know, to, to, for Hezekiah. And Hezekiah could have just greeted him and said, thank you for the gift, and send a response back to the king of Babylon. But instead, he takes all these envoys, and he shows them all the wealth of Israel. That's kind of, I mean, that's like almost opening up a safe where you keep the gold and saying, look at all the gold I have. <laughs> On the one hand, I mean, it, you can be proud of all the gold you have, but on the other hand, you're now just revealing uh, your entire treasury to a kingdom <laughs> that's, that, you know, that, that likes to conquer people. It doesn't seem like it's the wisest thing to do. So while Hezekiah may have been uh, connected to God, it seems like he didn't necessarily do the right thing. I mean, today in this world, people of means, and you know who they are, right? They always hide their wealth. They put them in shell companies and all that sort of thing. They don't want people to know how wealthy they are because if, you can, if you've got a lot of wealth and it's not shielded and people know how much you have, they're going to come after you. That's just the way it is. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that this was a wise thing for him to do, to open up his safe and show him everything. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Verse. Oh, well. Oh, mm, man. Uh, all right. So um, that's what we'll end there. Uh, 
at uh, verse 13. So we'll start at 14. I'm going to write this down. Uh, 2014 for Tuesday. Okay. All right. So, um, and we'll find out if this goes bad for Hezekiah or not. It might be that it goes okay, or it might be that it goes bad. We'll have to see. All right. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thanks for this beautiful day. And um, keep us in your grace until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for joining me. Those of you online, thank you, thank you. I uh, hope you have a great day. I pray you have a great day. I um, hope Neve is okay. I didn't see her yesterday either. All right. Um, and um, happy birthday, uh, Mia, or Elizabeth, <laughs> Lonsway, and Mom. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. God's blessings. Bye.